Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, on behalf of the Foreign Affairs Committee, let me also welcome you to today's meeting. I would especially like to welcome our new chairman of our European Parliament's delegation for relations with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Tom van den Kendelade. It's a pleasure to host this meeting together with SEDE, and I would really like to also personally welcome Jens Stoltenberg. I really appreciate your approach to discuss security and defense issues with members of the European Parliament on a regular basis. Dear Secretary General, I still very much remember our last exchange of views in this format. It was a bit more than a year ago, and since then, the global security scene has changed indeed, as Chairwoman Loiseau just pointed out. The COVID-19 pandem pandemic has caused a global shift, which is not only affecting millions of human lives, but also triggering systemic tensions of global governance with far-reaching and long-term consequences for international relations. And unfortunately, we are seeing that China and Russia are prepared to use this crisis to unravel the rules-based world order underpinned by multilateral organizations. Dear Jens Stoltenberg, I followed your speech very carefully at this year's digital security conference, the Munich Security Conference, and you underlined in this speech a couple of weeks ago in Munich that the rise of China, sophisticated cyber attacks, disruptive technologies, climate change, and Russia's destabilizing, destabilizing behavior and also the continued threat of terrorism are of greatest concern, not only for NATO. So I'm looking forward to hear from you how NATO will address these challenges and also how you intend to improve the cooperation between our two organizations, NATO and the European Union. Once again, a warm welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Chair, Natalie and, uh, and David. It is really a pleasure to be with you all again. Uh, and I'm happy that uh, uh, we are able also today to see and welcome a new chair of the delegation of the European uh, Parliament for relations uh, with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, Tom van der Kendelare. And as a former uh, parliamentarian myself, I really relish the opportunity to engage with elected representatives because I know how important your voices are in shaping policies that affect us all, upholding our democratic values and acting as the connection between our institutions and the people uh, we uh, all serve. So much has changed uh, since uh, the last time we spoke. Not least the global health pandemic, which prevents us from meeting in person today. The EU plays an important part in combating COVID-19 uh, and alleviating the economic consequences of the pandemic. This demonstrates the significant role uh, of the EU in addressing global challenges. NATO is also playing its part in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, we have been coordinating and facilitating military support to the civilian responses. Across the lines, our armed forces continue to play a vital role. From transporting medical supplies and personnel to setting up military field hospitals and securing borders. And now helping with the vaccine rollout too. But NATO's main task is to make sure that this health crisis does not become a security crisis. And that is exactly what we do. Our forces have remained ready and vigilant throughout. Because while our attention has rightly been focused on fighting the pandemic, our security threats have not gone away. Just the opposite. Existing trends and tensions have accelerated. Russia's destabilizing behavior, brutal forms of terrorism, sophisticated cyber attacks, disruptive technologies, the rise of China and the security impacts of climate change. No country or continent can face these challenges alone. Not Europe alone, 
nor America alone, but Europe and North America together. We now stand at an important juncture in transatlantic relations. We have a unique opportunity to open a new chapter. And I welcome President Biden's clear commitment to rebuilding alliances and strengthening NATO. We intend to set an ambitious and forward-looking agenda for our security and defense at the NATO summit later this year. This is at the heart of our NATO 2030 initiative to prepare our alliance for the future. To do so, we must reinforce the unity between Europe and North America. This unity derives from the promise of 30 allies to defend each other. Based on this commitment, we must also strengthen our political consultations, using NATO even more, as the unique platform bringing Europe and North America together every day, to consult uh, on all issues that affect our shared security. To prepare for the future, we must also broaden our approach to security. By increasing the resilience of our societies, maintaining our technological edge, and combating the security impact of climate change. And finally, we must safeguard the international rules-based order by working more closely with partners to build a global co community of like-minded democracies. Stronger cooperation with the European Union is an important part of our work for the future. And I'm proud, as you also referred to, that in recent years, we have been able to lift our cooperation to unprecedented levels. Today, NATO and the European Union are working closer together in many different areas, helping to stabilize our neighborhood from the Western Balkans to Ukraine, dealing with illegal migration in the Aegean, and addressing a range of hybrid threats from cyber attacks to disinformation campaigns. I welcome uh, EU efforts on defence, including the fullest possible involvement of non-EU allies in PESCO and the European Defence Fund for our mutual benefit. A European Union that spends more on defence, invests in new capabilities and reduces the fragmentation of the European defence industry is not only good for European security, it is also good for transatlantic security. We all know that more than 90% of the EU citizens live in countries that are NATO allies. At the same time, EU member states provide only 20% of NATO's defence spending. So it is obvious that the strong transatlantic bond in NATO remains the cornerstone of Europe's security now and for the future. As members of the European Parliament, you can help push for more ambitious and practical cooperation between NATO and the European Union. We can and should step up our cooperation in key areas. On military mobility, championing new technologies, bolstering our resilience, fighting climate change, and protecting the rules-based order. We have a lot in common, and in a more competitive world, we can achieve more together than alone. So I really look forward to today's discussion with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I'd like to give the floor to the President of the Delegation of Relations with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Mr. Tom van Kendeler. Go ahead, sir. For um, the introduction, thank you, Secretary General, for your statement and your presence with us today. And thank you also for your leadership, in particular also regarding EU-NATO relations. Secretary General, the NATO 2030 report of the Reflection Group appointed by yourself contains a series of recommendations regarding the EU-NATO consultations. And we welcome very much these recommendations. One could only hope that they will be taken into account and be validated by the heads of state and government at the next NATO summit. They make clear that there is still a lot of room for improvement. In particular, I think about the recommendations on setting up permanent structures for narrow 
political consultation, about taking more initiatives of common positioning like the Joint Declaration on Shared Issues and Concerns, and also about clarifying and promoting ways to avoid unnecessary duplication and political competition. The EU, we heard you very well, is well aware of the urgent need to step up efforts in the field of defence with a view of, to reinforcing the EU itself and NATO. In this regard, political readiness and commitments to seriously invest in an EU strategic compass justifies expectations and even optimism, even if NATO would decide, and rightly so, to further broaden its approach in terms of both geographical threats, with obviously a more global focus, and thematic challenges with particular focus on new technological evolutions. My question to you today, Secretary General, given the unique political momentum that we are living, created by more or less simultaneous stimulating opportunities, the review of the NATO strategic context, the development of a new strategic compass, and the prospects of a fruitful cooperation with the, next, with the new administration in Washington, my question, will these recommendations be translated during the next NATO summit into renewed and stronger commitments on the strategic partnership between NATO and the EU? I thank you. Merci. Je maintenant donner la parole au corps. Thank you. I'd like to give the floor to the coordinators. First of all, the coordinators of the Security and Defense Subcommittee, then the coordinators of the Foreign Affairs Committee for an initial lengthy series of questions, beginning with EPP, Arnaud Donjon. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur... Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary General, thank you for speaking once again to this parliamentary committee. I have two questions, quite precise. The first has to do with a very sensitive issue that the chair very directly touched upon in her intervention, that is Turkey. Very often, the expression community of values is employed to describe NATO, and you've mentioned it yourself. You talked about like-minded democracies. And this is all very interesting and laudable, but I have a problem in considering that Erdogan's Turkey, both with respect to its domestic and foreign and defense aspects, as a reliable ally and especially as an ally who has the same values as we do in terms of human rights, democracy, and pluralism, and civic life. So I would like to know how we can address this problem how this problem is addressed with NATO and whether it is addressed at all. So, of course, I'm going to gloss over all the provocations in the Eastern Mediterranean, which are well documented. And the second question I have is that EU-NATO cooperation issue. So it's been f five years since Warsaw, and in fact you re referred to this, that this cooperation has attained an unprecedented level. Wonderful, I believe it, and I'm delighted. But exactly what concrete issues has this cooperation attained an unprecedented level? Interpersonal relations, certainly, between yourself, the president of the commission, and so forth, all of that works very well, and we are delighted that there is this high-level dialogue taking place. But actually, in fact, what are the projects, the actual aspects in which we actually have EU-NATO cooperation that has attained an unprecedented level. Thank you. SND. Thank you for SND. Sven Nixer. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Secretary General, for being uh, with us and, and sharing your thoughts uh, with us. I have two questions. First of all, uh, one situation that is uh, looming very large on the global security and, and, and military security radar is the uh, situation in the uh, Taiwanese Straits and South China Sea. And geographically, it's obviously very, very far from the uh, North Atlantic, uh, but yet it uh, preoccupies a very significant amount of the attention of our largest ally, the United States. O only during the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, bold headlines about the Chinese Navy having grown uh, larger than that of the US. And we've seen warnings that China might seek a military solution uh, to the uh, Taiwan situation in a matter of uh, a few years from now. And, and also we've seen uh, uh, pieces of news about the U.S. being in a process of forging a regional alliance uh, with the 
uh, with a number of uh, Asian and uh, countries and Australia to to uh, address the common concerns in that regard. So uh, my first question is how 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 should that uh, affect the strategic thinking of the North Atlantic Alliance and 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 the European Union? Because we express a lot of worries, but obviously as the European Union, we are not in a position to do much uh, about this uh, situation um, by means of military security means. And the second question is about the unraveling of the of the international arms control uh, agreements. Obviously, we've seen a bit of positive news in the uh, announcement about the extension of the uh, of the uh, new START treaty by another five years. But uh, apart from that, we've we've only seen the uh, collapse of the INF, uh, of the of the uh, open skies. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future of the JCPOA. Uh, how does that uh, figure into the into the uh, discussions uh, about European security in the in the alliance uh, uh, formats of of uh, political discussion. Thank you. Merci pour Renew Europe, Petra Sarsrevici. Thank you, Petra Sarsrevici, for Renew. Thank you, Secretary General, for your comments as well as your constant uh, interaction with the European Parliament's uh, relevant committees. Indeed, uh, it wouldn't be an overstatement. Um, telling that NATO is next to the European Union, the world, uh, world's most uh, successful alliance. And to maintain this status, uh, you rightly point out that uh, in the NATO 2030 vision, that we have to be able to deal with our two main adversaries, Russia and China. Both those countries have invested heavily in cyber war warfare capacity, disinformation, and have shown the don't uh, respect uh, human rights and the rule of law. You mention in your report that we must support uh, the development of a comprehensive response framework for countering hybrid threats and building resilience. I fully agree that hybrid attacks are kind of low cost way for both Russia and China to attack us. And just to mention as an example, recently the European medicines agency was victim of the Russian intelligence agency and Chinese spies. Do you, Secretary General, believe we should use Article 5 also in the case of cy cyber warfare? And how can NATO and the European Union become fully ready for to strike back? And my second question, Secretary General, I would appreciate your comments on the partner countries uh, with uh, NATO and uh, in the, jointly with the European Union. I mean, how do you see this cooperation between us and, uh, I mean, NATO and uh, partner countries developing, and in which way you see this development going the best? Thank you. Merci pour idée, Anna bon... Thank you, Anna Bond Frisco for ID. Grazie, pres... Thanks very much, Chair. Good afternoon, Secretary General Stoltenberg. We are very much assuaged by your words. The Alliance is working in an international environment where challenges are springing up everywhere. They are interconnected. These are military, non-military and hybrid challenges. I'm concerned about uh, this health in, in environment, the seas attacks on dem democracies based on liberal values and the malicious use of cyber instruments. I, AI, it can have a disruptive influence on new technologies. The freedom of sailing in the southern Chinese seas is one of these challenges. There are already French US vessels out there. In the Pacific, we need a open, common and a free vision. And the free and open Pacific is the right tool. My question is this, does the NATO intend uh, uh, to bolster co collaboration with India and other ally allies to sweep the carpet out from under Chinese, China's feet. Taiwan is deemed by us to be a shining example of democracy. It's a great economy and it is great when it comes to developing te technologies. We would like Taiwan to have a, have a free and open future. What does this mean for NATO? Will you be fighting against authoritarianism in any form, including digital forms? Here, Russia is public enemy number one. How does NATO intend uh, 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 
intend to, to fight these attacks rather than just buffering them. Thank you very much for the Greens. Alvina Almetza for the Greens, please. Je vais passer, uh... Let's move on to the next speaker on the list, uh, Anna Futiga for ECR, and then we'll go back to the Greens straight away afterwards. Anna Futiga for uh, ECR, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Secretary General. Thank you for, for um, your presence in, in our joint committee uh, meeting, your, as usual, and so that's certain uh, custom already, and moreover, Thank you for your perseverance and uh, uh, diplomatic skills in navigating very stormy waters of, of global security and, and to your uh, endeavors to, to, to make NATO even stronger. NATO that is already the most successful defense uh, alliance uh, in world's uh, history. Uh, certainly, cooperation between EU and NATO is uh, of uh, utmost importance, uh, yet I would like to especially to thank you for your words concerning the transatlantic bond in protecting uh, the Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, area against threats and challenges uh, that are enormous, just to name the aggressive posture uh, of, of Russia destabilizing role of this country, rising China as, as rightly mentioned, but we, we have uh, the, 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 the way forward uh, and, and that is stipulated uh, in the first uh, the report, independent experts report that I was uh, um, really privileged to participate in, uh, but uh, mostly in, in your food for thought paper prepared before uh, the summit. Uh, I value very much uh, remarks that are provided. I see uh, some new ideas there as well. Allow me questions uh, as, as well on, on uh, this. Uh, uh, do you see prospects uh, for new strategic uh, concept? Uh, I look forward to, to, to unity during NATO summit as we were able to achieve a unity in the group of experts that was not so so easy at all yet to, to cooperation uh, thanks to your, uh, leadership as well and 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 cooperation with with uh, NATO headquarters uh, and our will to achieve uh, unity we were able to do this I look forward to same uh, during the summer uh, summit and one question as well about prospects of bringing China because all of us we are concerned with the race of China and more and more aggressive uh, Can posture you make, please conclude country. Mrs. Fatiga um, do you see possibility for bringing China to the table uh, of disarmament thank you Merci. thank you very much we unfortunately are not able to uh, connect to Alvina Almetza so we'll give the floor to Mick Willis from the left please uh, the NATO 2030 report, entitled uh, United for a New Era, commissioned by you last March, uh, firmly singles out Russia and China as the main threats to NATO countries at present and into the future. They represent, according to the report, both a geostrategic and an, an ideological threat to NATO member states. Repeated references is made to Russian aggression and the so-called rise of China as a security threat. Now, NATO was formed in 1949 as a, a potential way, of, an organization dedicated really to stopping a, a possible Soviet invasion of Europe. Uh, but with the dissolution of the USSR in 1991, NATO moved from a guard dog to more to an attack dog. And I mean, has expanded now beyond the borders of Europe and had some very uh, negative experiences in Libya, Afghanistan, and Iraq. I mean, my, my questions to you, Secretary General Do you honestly think that Russia are capable and likely to invade Europe anytime soon? 
Uh, last year, the Americans spent over 700 billion on defense, on arms. Russia spent less than 70. They're spending less than one-tenth. They're actually not a serious player. Now, China are a serious player, but uh, China is not a security threat to us. China is a, might be a financial threat to US financial supremacy, but not a security threat. There is no Chinese boats in the Gulf of Mexico or in the Atlantic coast of North America. There is American uh, warships in the South China Sea. China hasn't dropped a bomb on anyone for 40 years. Seriously, do you honestly think that China could possibly consider invading Europe anytime soon? Thanks. Merci, je passe. Thank you very much. Let's now move on to the AFET coordinators. And we will begin with uh, Antonio Lipas, Historis White for the EPP, please. Yes, hello, uh, dear Secretary General, Mr. Stoltenberg. Thank you very much for attending the committee today. As um, well, my position, my speaking time today is as rapporteur on the uh, report on EU NATO cooperation. And as such, I want to applaud your work and consistent calls for more cooperation between our two institutions. I think that, believe, despite the challenges very well, some of them very well put by my colleague Arnaud and John, we should remember that there has been never been more cooperation between the EU and NATO. I believe we have right now a unique opportunity to strengthen this transatlantic uh, defence link, an opportunity to increase our European ambitions also in defence, always together with our NATO allies. The EU is currently working on its strategic compass, while NATO is working on the strategic concept. I think that both processes must complement each other and come to a coherent conclusion, identifying common threats and define necessary next steps to address them. Moreover, the new American administration that has been mentioned by some of my colleagues has shown its readiness to engage with its European counterparts, shown in the recent EU's US decision to join the uh, project in military mobility. We have to build upon our EU NATO success stories, like our close cooperation in the fight against cyber attacks or on military mobility, as you mentioned. They offer clear examples of the added value of working together. Secretary General, I am of the opinion that NATO will always be the main pillar of our transatlantic defense and that the European Union has tools that can complement it to a great extent. I know that you share my thoughts, which is why I want to ask you, how can, how can we ensure that this dialogue is permanent and formalized? What format do you think we can aim to establish between our two institutions exactly for this purpose? Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much. Let's now hear from Tonino Pizzola of Messendi. Madam President. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, rebuilding the transatlantic relationship is a really challenging task with the new and emerging circumstances, which we need to address together with possible, when possible. That does not exclude the will of the European Union to develop its strategic autonomy that goes beyond military aspects. This pandemic clearly showed us the need to invest in resources to ensure our security and protect our citizens. Countries such as Russia and China are trying to exert their influence by increasing economic, political and cyber advantage in the pandemic. They are using their vaccine diplomacy to spread their interest, especially in developing countries and in the European Union neighbourhood. I think it's a something that both European Union and NATO need to pay particular attention because it will have long-lasting effects. As a European Parliament Standing Rapporteur on US and S&D Shadow Rapporteur on EU-NATO relations, I'm very curious to hear about the outcome of your recent talks with the US President Biden and other high-ranking US officials. What are signals you are getting from the new US administration as regards transatlantic cooperation and NATO? You have mentioned the role of climate change in security and defense. Can you provide more details on how will the impact of climate change affect our ongoing security threats and outstanding issues. Finally, UK has recently left European Union as a strong security and defence actor. How can we use NATO as a forum to enhance security and defence cooperation between UK and the European Union? Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. We don't have uh, Mr. Mariani from ID with us, so let's now try and uh, reconnect with uh, Ms. Alametsa from the Greens. 
Mrs. Alametsa, could you please press on the speak button? Il y a manifest well, there really does seem to be a problem with the connection there. So let's move on to uh, Munia Satori for the Greens. Merci, Madame la... Thank you very much, Chair. Secretary General. We can no longer close our eyes as to the activities uh, of uh, NATO members uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. Army um, is actually producing more emissions than a Sweden, a whole country. So we really do have to address this issue. Mr. Stoltenberg, I don't share uh, your um, reluctance um, to move forward on this because um, we need to look at the costs here and we also need to make sure that we have more political autonomy and more uh, coherence within the Union in terms of security policy. So, but our objective is uh, not just peace and security. No, the objective of uh, the, the Alliance in its international uh, cooperation uh, let, let me now move on to this very important point. The um, nuclear agreements that um, NATO has and the arms, uh, the weapons that are stationed in uh, the European Union are very, very dangerous. We are convinced that uh, strategic dissuasion um, means that these, um, th these weapons are uh, illegal, amoral, and they're utterly superfluous. And what about the uh, treaty um, banning nuclear weapons? Unfortunately, you were very virulent in your um, statements here uh, because these tactical weapons no longer have their place in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies. Um, Clement Groschel from Renew Europe. Uh, and unfortunately, I, uh, I missed your name on the list, so I'll give you the floor straight away. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Uh, as a strong supporter of strategic partnership between NATO and NATO EU, I think that on United and with combined compatibilities and determination we can confront security and other challenges of the modern time. I don't see European strategic autonomy as a competition to the NATO, but more as a complementary tool for achieving our shared strategic goals. I have two sets of questions and dilemmas. The first one is Afghanistan. After more than a decade and a half, we are sooner or later leaving this country. And my dilemma after all engagement and losses we suffered there is, did we ensure ourselves guarantees all the progress which, will be, which was made will not be lost? And above all, how will we protect and help all those who were believing in us and were, were helping us in the last decade and a half? I must say that repetition of what happened after the Soviet withdrawal would have tremendous negative political and geopolitical implications for the West as a whole. I think we cannot afford ourselves this kind of repetition of the past. The other question is related to defense spending. I see many countries have increased the national defense spending in relative and absolute terms. But I know since I'm coming from one of such countries, the question arises, how can we assure that defense spending is done in a rational and purposeful way? I know in many countries, it is not only a question of dedicating more resources for the defense, but more and more also how these funds are spent. I know NATO has special aid agency to help, but I think we need more. We need more concrete planning, help and support in execution of these procurements because taxpayers are not very happy with present budget overruns. Do you, in the frame of new NATO Vision 2030 presented a few weeks ago, envisage this kind of support? Do you expect more of common defense development and procurement projects on NATO and EU level and EU and NATO combined level? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For the ECR, uh, Vitold Jan Vashikovsky, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Secretary General, uh, for being with us. Uh, yes, greetings from, from Warsaw. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that uh, because of the changes and the problems created in the last decades, like uh, Russian behavior, like uh, ISIS behavior, uh, we need to update the strategic concept of, uh, of NATO. That's, uh, that's obvious. And uh, my remark is that, uh, please, uh, Mr. Secretary-General, make sure that, uh, that NATO uh, remains the, the main institutions for uh, conducting these debates on security, but also uh, to carry to the, on decisions on, on, uh, on security. 
Uh, there is a proliferation of other fora uh, to debate security in the transatlantic area. For instance, there is a dialogue between the European Union and uh, United States. This kind of a dialogue may eliminate uh, NATO from this debate. Uh, it means that uh, this will eliminate, eliminate uh, such important countries like Turkey, but also your homeland, uh, Norway. So please, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary General, make sure that NATO is the most important decisive factor and instrument to decide about security. Secondly, uh, please make sure that uh, in this debate, uh, traditional threats uh, to security, uh, that means the military threats, are high on the agenda, and also military responses are high on the agenda. I don't want to uh, neglect uh, that uh, other factors uh, influencing security agenda. You mentioned uh, um, climate changes. Of course, climate changes affect the uh, behavior of the countries and nations, create a massive wave of migrants. Uh, uh, this will, this of course, affects uh, our emissions uh, and affects security. But uh, please make sure that uh, traditional threats are also uh, uh, important on this uh, on this agenda. Um, uh, I, I I think that it is supposed to be uh, efficient, uh, military efficient uh, institutions to deter. Threats, and then if it's um, it, uh, it, it, uh, it finally it's eventually it's uh, able to uh, reconquer uh, territories and countries which are taken by eventual um, aggressor. I thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. For the note attached, uh, Kostas Papadakis, please. Το ΝΑΤΟ είναι ταυτισμένο με πραξικοπήματα. Thank you very much. We see NATO in the same way as we see our states. Look at the uh, occupation of Greece. Look at uh, uh, Yugoslavia. There was bloodshed there. It always seems to find an alibi somewhere or another, but there are countries that have been bombed by NATO, of course. And these are countries where you have populations who, uh, who lost their households, lost their livelihoods, lost everything. And there are those, of course, who think that um, NATO can use nuclear weapons. And they state that the, uh, the wars that... Um, you know, can be hidden with words such as security and defense. Well, it's clear what's happening here. NATO does not recognize the border between Turkey and Greece, and it just sees it as a global space, as just as, as the Mediterranean, basically. And then, of course, there are those who want to benefit from the um, from what's in the Mediterranean, from the Mediterranean's resources. Um, we want to be free of NATO, free of the European Union, to make sure that um, you know that, that we can properly represent the people. So I will now give the floor to the Secretary General to uh, address the many questions that were laid at his door. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you for all your questions and your uh, comments. I uh, have taken duly note of uh, all of them. Um, my understanding is that I should try to limit myself to uh, roughly eight minutes, so I will not be able to go through every question, but I will try to group the main issues you have uh, uh, raised. Uh, first, uh, some of you refer to this expert uh, group, uh, which has uh, played a very important role uh, in uh, in supporting my work on NATO uh, 2030, uh, and uh, and uh, I would also like to, to recognize uh, Anna Fotiga. She was member of the group, uh, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for for the advice and the input that the group has uh, has provided. Of course, uh, the, the, that that will be followed up, uh, and it's part of. Uh, of the ongoing uh, process and discussion uh, among NATO allies. The group presented 138 different proposals. 
based on that and also input from the from uh, from the NATO parliamentary assembly from from the capitals and and from many others i have uh, put forward um, uh, eight strategic level proposals which are now discussed among allies and and i hope and believe that uh, based on this, uh, NATO leaders, when they meet in, in Brussels later on this year, they can make some really forward-leaning, strategic, uh, ambitious uh, decisions on how to further uh, strengthen the transatlantic bond uh, in NATO, uh, uh, bringing 30 allies together and addressing all the different challenges uh, we see. So the answer is yes, uh, the report has... Uh, has um, has uh, has been an important part of that process, and and we continue the discussions uh, in NATO. And and one element of that is, of course, also how can we further strengthen uh, cooperation between NATO and the European uh, Union. I was also asked um, uh, whether this cooperation between the European Union and NATO has actually led to something, and my answer is yes, absolutely. We are actually working together on many different uh, uh, issues. Um, uh, we have strengthened our cooperation when it comes to cyber. Uh, we have uh, 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 exercises where we exercise uh, in parallel together to to help and uh, and learn from uh, uh, each other. Uh, we have. Um, we have um, we are uh, exchanging information real time on cyber attacks. Um, we we work on military mobility. Uh, we are in close contact and 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 describing what kind of needs NATO uh, has to be able to move uh, military equipment, for instance, coming in from the United States and be able to move them across across Europe to our battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance. Uh, also, and of course, important part for for the European Union, but NATO and the European Union has to work together addressing these issues. We work together, uh, providing support for partners in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Tunisia, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. We coordinate our efforts in these uh, countries. We do different things, but but together we complement our efforts uh, uh, working with these uh, partners. Uh, and I also mentioned the. the the cooperation we have in addressing uh, migration uh, and, uh, and the illegal uh, migration we have seen in the GNC, where actually NATO ships um, uh, are present in the GNC, helping to implement the agreement between the European Union and Turkey, uh, and bringing Turkey, uh, EU, Frontex, Greece together uh, in the Aegean on NATO ships. Uh, to help to implement that uh, that uh, agreement, and there are many other examples, uh, and I think there is a huge potential to further uh, uh, strengthening this cooperation. And and part of NATO 2030, we are working on how to further strengthen NATO EU uh, cooperation. So uh, and then uh, let me add, on top of that, we have the political consultations on a wide range of issues. So so when when. Uh, when Josep, Josep um, Borrell, uh, the high representative, uh, participates in NATO ministerial meetings, or I participate in EU de defense uh, ministerial meetings, or I meet, uh, for instance, with you, or I met last month with the European Council, with all the EU leaders, that's part of the close consultations we need at all levels uh, to further strengthen our cooperation and our partnership, NATO and the European uh, Union. Uh, then uh, I had several questions on China. China is not an adversary, uh, and actually the rise of China provides uh, uh, some serious and, 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 and some real opportunities for NATO and for EU and for all our uh, countries uh, when it comes to trade, uh, uh, economic growth, uh, uh, and the rise of China has also helped to lift um, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. At the same time, the rise of China also poses some serious challenges. Uh, China is an authoritarian country that doesn't share our values. Uh, they would soon have the biggest economy in the world. Uh, they already have the second largest defense budget. They're investing heavily in new modern military capabilities. And I strongly believe that NATO should remain a regional alliance, North America and Europe. But I also believe that the threats and the challenges we face in this region uh, they are more and more global. And the rise of China, the, the, the shift in global balance of power uh, caused by the rise of China is part of that. And if anything, that just makes it even more important that Europe and North America stand together in NATO. Because Europe is not big enough, United States is not big, uh, big enough, but together uh, we represent 50% of the world's GDP and 50% of the world's military might. So if you're concerned about the rise of China, the military and economic strength of China, that makes it even more important that we uh, stand together 
uh, uh, Europe and uh, and North America in uh, in NATO. Then, of course, I recognise that that NATO is only part of the answer. There are climate change issues. There are there are economic issues which are not for NATO to address. Uh, but when it comes to deterrence, defence, uh, and also resilience of our societies, I think that NATO plays a key role in bringing Europe and North America together in developing. Um, a response to the rise of, uh, of China. Um, then I was asked by uh, some of you about uh, 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 arms control. Uh, Sven Mixer asked me that question, and others also refer to that. NATO has been at the forefront uh, of arms control for decades. Um, uh, we were therefore extremely, or we are extremely concerned when we now have seen the unraveling on some of the most important agreements, uh, especially the INF uh, treaty that banned all intermediate range uh, weapons. That has been extremely important for the security of Europe. The reason why we have seen the demise of the INF treaty is that Russia has violated the treaty. Uh, and deployed uh, many uh, missiles, uh, nuclear capable, uh, in Europe, uh, and and of course then that treaty doesn't work. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, we also then welcome the agreement between the United States and Russia to extend New START, uh, limiting the number of uh, long-range or strategic uh, uh, warheads. Um, uh, that's extremely important. The last remaining. Um, uh, uh, treaty uh, limiting the number of uh, nuclear warheads in the world. At the same time, we believe that the extension of New START can uh, not should not be the end, but actually should be the beginning of renewed efforts in addressing arms control. That includes uh, getting China uh, to be part of uh, arms control in the future, because China becomes a more and more important military power, investing heavily in new. Uh, long-range nuclear capabilities, missiles, uh, uh, and other uh, nuclear capabilities. And therefore, uh, we would work for, and we are working for, uh, 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 including China in future arms control agreements. Then uh, I was asked about whether I see any threat against uh, NATO allies uh, from China or from, uh, from, uh, from Russia. I don't see any imminent threat of uh, any military against uh, 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 of, um, of a military uh, attack against any NATO ally. Uh, but one reason for that is that we have NATO, uh, based on the idea that if one ally is attacked, it will trigger the response from the whole alliance, all for one and one for all. And that's one of the main reasons why we have been able to preserve peace in Europe for more than 70 years. It's an unprecedented period of time. The EU is an important, an important institution built after the Second World War, and NATO is another uh, a key institution uh, preserving peace in, uh, in our part of the world. But we have seen Russia using force and military uh, force against neighbours, but not against NATO neighbours. Not, not, not against Norway or the Baltic countries or Poland or other countries in, uh, in Europe, but they have used it against Ukraine, illegally annexing Crimea, continue to destabilize eastern uh, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, against Georgia, and Russia has troops in Moldova without the um, consent of the Moldovan uh, government. And we see more Russian military presence in many places of uh, the world. We've also seen a more aggressive China, uh, and, uh, and China also threatening Taiwan and other countries, bullying countries all, all over the world. Uh, 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 and, and, uh, and this behavior is undermining the uh, rule of law, uh, the, the, the international uh, rules-based order, and that's also an argument for uh, NATO allies standing together and working with partners, including in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Then uh, I have to also mention Turkey. I had at least one question about Turkey. Um, I have um, expressed uh, my uh, uh, serious concerns um, and we all know that there are uh, serious differences and some issues, uh, ranging from the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the, the Turkish uh, decision uh, to buy uh, the Russian defend, uh, air missile as an air, air defense system, S-400, or related to, uh, to, to democratic rights in, in Turkey. We are an alliance of 30 different allies, uh, with different political parties, with, uh, with different histori history, geography, and, and different, difficult, different political parties in, in, uh, in, uh, in government. But, uh, and therefore, there are differences, and, and there will be differences. But I believe that NATO 
at least then provide um, an important uh, platform for discussing these issues, raising these issues, issues, and having serious debates and discussions about uh, different concerns from 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 the Eastern Med to uh, to uh, many other uh, issues. I also think that NATO's role is to make sure that we do whatever we can to reduce tensions. Uh, we have been able to establish what we call deconfliction mechanism between uh, Greece and Turkey. We have the Aegean activity uh, in place, and we also see now that uh, 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 we have helped to pave the way for exploratory talks between Greece and Turkey on the underlying disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I'm not saying that these problems are solved. I'm not saying that there are no reason for uh, concern, but I'm saying that uh, when we have difficulties, when we have differences, when we have disagreements, also on serious and important issues, I think we need international institutions to provide a platform to try to find ways to address them and to find uh, 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 how we can agree on steps in the right direction. And that's exactly what NATO uh, is trying uh, uh, to uh, do. Then the last thing I think I have time to uh, briefly mention is uh, climate change. Um, I think that we should push much more for, for, for addressing climate change. Uh, climate change is a crisis multiplier. Uh, it affects directly our security uh, and therefore it matters for NATO. And NATO should assess and understand the link between climate change and security. We need to adapt because more extreme weather will, will directly affect how we can uh, uh, conduct our military operations. It will affect uh, naval bases all, all over the world with, uh, with rising sea levels. The melting of the ice will, strain, will impact the strategic situation in the high north uh, and so on. So we need to uh, adapt how we do our, uh, our military uh, operations and, uh, and, uh, and posture. And lastly, NATO should play its part in helping to reduce emissions. Um, we know that if we're able to reduce uh, the, the, the dependency on fossil fuels in military operations, uh, we will partly reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, but we will also make our missions more resilient because a very vulnerable part of any military operation is the supply of uh, huge amounts of fossil fuels to different military operations. So operational effectiveness and uh, climate uh, uh, change or reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases actually goes hand in hand if we do this in the right way and we are addressing these issues with our science for, for peace programs and, and in other ways. If I'm going to stay uh, uh, to my promise of not being too long in my summing up, I'm afraid that uh, what I'm able to cover. Uh, but uh, again, thank you so much for all your comments and, uh, and your inputs. And, um, and I really appreciate this opportunity to once again uh, uh, engage, uh, engage with uh, the European Parliament. And I think that's one example of of many of how we are stepping up the cooperation between NATO and the European Union. Merci, Monsieur Secretary General. Je passe maintenant la parole pour des remarques conclusives. Thank you, Secretary General. Just for some comments, uh, Mr. McAllister. McAllister. Dear Secretary General, dear Jens Stoltenberg, the discussion today has made very clear that the security challenges we face are numerous. In this respect, I would like to stress that NATO is of key insurance to ensure European freedom and security. I would like to personally thank you for this very interesting exchange of views. I would also like to thank you personally for your commitment towards a close cooperation between the European Union and NATO. The EU is the EU and NATO is NATO. We make our independent decisions, but we find ways to work together because I strongly believe together we are stronger and we are safer. So I'm looking forward to continue our discussions with you, how to deepen mutual understanding and to consolidate the cooperation between NATO and the European Parliament. Once again, thank you so much and all the best for your important work in Brussels. Merci. Merci en effet, Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for being with us by video conference today. I think that these exchanges are useful, they're much appreciated, and of course we have many questions that remain. I'm sorry for my colleagues who weren't able to ask questions, but this our time available is very short. 
And I hope that we'll be able to delve into the detail of cooperation between the European Union and NATO through the UN initiative report that is underway.